in the offshore acreages offshore of Tobago. So in conclusion, what I'd like to just put to you is that geology in, the, in an overall sense has an important place in the island's development. And how is it important? It's important in terms of identifying what resources are available to the nationals of the island. It's important to understand how we could sustain it for future generations. It's also important in development of policies in, in how, we, how we pursue various development projects, for example, road works, understanding the structure of rocks and the integrity of rocks. We know how to construct not only roadways, but perhaps coastal barriers to prevent coastal depredation. And that's a, just one example. And once we can factor in geology and its importance into the national landscape, we can definitely, it definitely has its place in development of the, of the island of Tobago. Okay, thank you. Now, now I, I would like, like to invite, invite Ms. Carol Telema to continue the presentation. Okay, so Ms. Julia Farrell, I would be hello, Ms. Julia Farrell, to introduce Ms. Telema because I was having some technical difficulties, but I'm back for now. So I think I'll just do more for Ms. Telema before I continue. Before we go. No, Ms. Carol Telema, we're not likely to show up the school here at the end of the school. Ladies and gentlemen, are you all hearing me now? Okay, lovely. So a little bit about Ms. Carol Tenima. Do not let her youthful appearance fool you at all. She has decades, decades of experience and not just experience, but experience from a senior position also. She started her career in the petrochemical industry as a geologist, just like Ms. Julia Farrell. And she did develop a lot of skills when it comes to not just drilling oil, but also finding oil and gas or petrochemicals all together. And the extensiveness, I would imagine that it goes even beyond oil and gas. There are other petrochemicals involved. She could tell you a little bit more about that. She headed the exploration and development sector of the Petrochin, which recently closed down, relatively recently closed down. And there she did not only learn about human resource management and finance, et cetera. That's some really exciting stuff. I have some questions for her. But also she learned about some stuff that the Tobagoians might be particularly interesting, such as how contracts are negotiated, et cetera. And she also learned about international law where petrochemical industries are concerned. And so she makes the most fitting follow-up for that presentation we just got from Ms. Julia Farrell. And by the way, Ms. Julia Farrell you did an excellent job, I must say. And so with no further ado, I invite now Ms. Carol Tenemark to give you two part of the today's lecture. Ms. Carol Tenemark, are you there? If Ms. Carol Tenimak is in there, I did some research and I could do it half for her. <laughs> I'm sure she's here. Hold on one minute. Hold on one minute. So Ms. Carol Tenimak, I see she has started her screen sharing. So she's going to be with you guys in a little bit. You know what? I think I want to take this opportunity to ask Miss Julia Farrell a question. No? Miss Julia Farrell is sitting not too far away from me. So I have the opportunity to 
to see a head shake, you know, I'm going to wait like everybody else until the end of the show. But since she doesn't want to answer my question, I'm going to put her on blast. If Miss Julia Farrell looks familiar, that is because being a geologist is not her only skill. She is a self-proclaimed lurker, professional lurker. She has been a member of the Tobago Writers Guild for a while now. <laughs> She has been a member, she's in our chat, she attends our other lectures, she attends our general meetings, whenever I need advice on certain things, she's one of the persons I very often turn to, she's always wrong. So when you are in the Tobago Writers Guild um, chat, if you have any questions pertaining to the presentation she gave today, you could just um, tag her name to it and pull her out of wherever she's looking. Uh, Ms. Telima, are you there? Okay. And I'm also taking this opportunity to tell everyone and remind those who already know that this lecture series is, is not just coming to you from the Tobago Library, but also from the Tobago Library Services. I want to read. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Okay. Okay, are you is everyone hearing me now? Yes, I'm hearing you. Everyone else? Yes. All right, let's keep our fingers crossed that uh, it will go well. 
Okay, I'm trying to bring up the uh, the uh, slideshow now. So, Mr. Nimak. Yes, While we're waiting for the presentation to open or to start properly, is it possible we could have a short conversation about exactly who you are, what you did, and probably even a full view of what you are about yeah. to witness? Right. Well, let me just uh, uh, make a few comments. Um, uh, first of all, uh, thank you for the kind introduction, Leroy, and uh, thank you for the, to, the Tobago Writers Guild for the kind invitation. Me, to share some of my thoughts on Tobago. Um, I certainly am no expert on Tobago matters, but I hope I have put together some uh, slides with certain elements of Tobago and its geology that I hope uh, will be of interest to the uh, audience and would also feed into the conversation around the economic and social development of the island. It's everyday life and how and, and some of the things that people need to be speaking about uh, in terms of crafting a future of more of Tobago being more developed than it is at this present time. So. Uh, Essentially, uh, that's what uh, the, the presentation is, is meant to be. It's meant to, to contribute to your conversations around Tobago, its current status and its aspirations for the future. Mr. Nima. Yes, Lira. Um, our marketing director just shared with me that if it's becoming difficult for you to get your presentation to come on, one of the things mm -hmm. that you can do, you can email it to her. Mm -hmm. I believe in the chat that we have for those of us who are um, preparing for this lecture, you can find the email right there and she would be able to pre put it on for you. All right. Well, the other alternative is that I can just, uh, rather than doing it as a slideshow, I can just use the slides in their raw form. But I try to email it. I'm not sure whether it's uh, too big to email, but let me try. You said that the email address is in the WhatsApp note that you sent. Mr. Lima? Yes. Okay, so I got a little update. Not that she would share it, but you could go ahead and do your presentation 
And by the time you're finished with the presentation, all the things that you would have shared would then be brought forward so people would have a better idea of what you were speaking about. But I know due to your leadership skills, et cetera, you can present it even without it if necessary. I, I read your bio, it's very impressive. And I know you do these lectures and presentations on a very regular basis. Yes, just a minute, be So, I've been talking to Ms. Julia Farrell, and what we're going to do in the meantime, we're going to have a little bit of conversation with Ms. Julia Farrell, and also if Ms. Tenima could be happy to chime in. Um, let's have a little bit of a discussion. First thing, Ms. Julia Farrell, I was very happy that you spoke about some of the things that are listed on the Ministry of Energy and Energy Industries page, um, the government, of course. And the reason why I was happy you spoke about this is because while there are things there that are listed as being particularly important to the economy, for Trinidad and Tobago in particular, and for Trinidad and Tobago in general, I was distracted, sorry. Trinidad and Tobago in general and Tobago in particular, some of those things have not been explored sufficiently to really say that we're capitalizing on it or even the extent to which these things are present. And I'm talking obviously about stuff like chromium, um, copper, etc. And when I look at the map that you presented, I saw a closer version of the map and I saw that the volcanic areas, one particular volcanic area was closer to the Scarborough area. Does that mean that if we were to find these things in a noteworthy numbers or quantity, that the Scarborough area around Glen Road area so would be a better area? Have you looked at that? Where, where does it seem most likely to, it would pop up? If at all. Look like Miss Carol Tenimak's presentation is online, so she'll be with us very shortly. So Miss Tenimak, as soon as you're ready, you just let me know and you take over, right? Yes. But first let's hear from Miss Julia Farrell with that one question that I asked. I think, I think um, if, if the resource were to exist, exist, and we're referring to copper and chromium, I actually think it may be located within the area of the main ridge. Okay, with some overlap into the more populated areas such as Scarborough. Okay. Um, and your question was related to how it would be affected or... Am I being heard? Yes, you're being heard. No, you actually just answered my question in, in, in every way possible. Uh, once it's in the middle, of course, the middle, you did uh, do some studies when it comes to water, etc. And the middle is extremely important to Tobago being the oldest protected rainforest, yes, for tourism purposes. 
but also because the Midridge, the trees in the Midridge produce a large percentage of the rainfall that we get here in Tobago, we, we would want to be careful about being overly curious where those things are concerned. Am I right? Very much so. Um, as I would have mentioned earlier, the main ridge is, um, is, has a protected forest area, right? And if we were to explore any subsurface, it would mean environmental degradation of that pristine um, forest reserve that we have here. All right. And the reason why I suspect if we were to do investigations and identify quantifiable copper and chromium, I have identified those areas in particular because they would have the rock properties and constituents that would help form the ore. Because normally you don't get copper and chromium in its raw form. Or it's it, in its pure form, I should say. You get it in a raw form and then it's processed. So you therefore need to conduct the various methodologies to investigate the nature of the rock to identify the ore, right? The volcanic, volcanic materials tend to carry with its compositions of the various combinations of minerals that would help in the formation of the ore that is that would then house the copper and chromium, okay? But I would suspect, and in the absence of actual studies in any detailed studies being available to us, I would not think it's a wise or there's a to pursue it in any great scale. For the main reason being the, the necessity of the main ridge forested area uh, that it creates the high relief that is needed for rainfall, which would feed our streams, our rivers, which will in turn feed our reservoirs for treatment by water to get portable water to homes. And it would also feed the aquifers and this water table that as we would have seen on one of the maps that I would have shown in passing, there, uh, there's the existence of aquifers that we can now channel into other areas of Tobago's development. I think, I'm not sure if it's general knowledge, but this could be one resource that we could consider using the groundwater resources that are available. Now, as I'm mentioning groundwater, I just think I should mention it now that in times of the dry season, if we can manage the drawdown of those water tables, within the aquifers that have been identified, we could manage um, how we smartly use irrigation systems to help maintain the agricultural industry on the island. So that is just one key way in which the groundwater resource is part and parcel of various aspects of development of the island, particularly agriculture as an example that I've just used. We have um, members of the Hello. 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 Yes, we are hearing you. All right. Are you seeing my screen? Yes. Good. All right. All right. So I'm not going to use the slide show. I'm going to use the slides in their raw form uh, so as not to endanger the presentation any further. So uh, I'll get straight into it because I've, I've kept you all long enough uh, because of these problems. So um, <clears throat> again, thank you, Leroy, for the invitation from the famous Writers Guild to do this presentation. Um, the outline of the presentation, I would give you some context, a geologic context within which the rest of the presentation is going to be um, structured. Uh, I'm going to talk about Tobago onshore, offshore, and I will end with some brief conclusion. 
Now, Julia gave you all quite a, a comprehensive um, uh, description of the evolution, uh, geologic evolution that resulted in Tobago reaching its current position. And what I call all of that is the collision that changed everything. Because the island, which we now call home, resulted from the Caribbean plate moving eastward up to thousands of kilometers from its original position. And as Julia said, most of Tobago is composed of volcanics and metamorphics. So these were formed by volcanic eruption and metamorphic changes far away from where they are located today, those rocks. So um, the collision ended about 5 million years ago. And if you think about it, you have large chunks of crust moving uh, relentlessly eastward. And when they collide, a lot of things happen. The rocks themselves are put under tremendous stresses that cause them to fracture, that cause them to fold, that cause them to change their composition. And that collision has ended, but the plates haven't stopped moving. It has changed from collision to now what we call share, which is where the plates are moving and sliding past one another. And one of the impacts of that is earthquakes, which I'm sure all of us in Trinidad and in Tobago are quite familiar with as they occur and have occurred over several decades uh, in our lifetimes. Now, this is the geologic map of Tobago, which Julia spoke about. And when you look at the map, you look at the legend, which describes what these colors mean. The you would see that there are all sorts of strange names like biotite, tonalite, dabros, andesites, and so on. And some of the rocks have names like the Argyle Formation, the Bacolet Formation, and so on, and so on. So that when you look at Tobago, you can see that within those belts that Julia described, that they're all types of different metamorphic, volcanic, and sedimentary rocks. And the importance of that is that each type of rock would have its own chemical and its own physical characteristics. And uh, geologists understand some of those characteristics well and apply them to economic consideration. The other important feature of Tobago is that there's a long curved feature running across the island in this position here. It's called the Central Tobago Fault. And a fault is a break in rocks with the rocks on one side of the fault moving relative to the rocks on the other side of the fault. In this particular case of this fault running across the entire island of Tobago, and it even continues offshore, the rocks on the north side, which is mostly the metamorphic rocks, uh, have moved up vertically upward relative to the rocks on the south side of that fault. In addition to which, there are other faults that break up the rocks, making it a very complex collage of fault blocks that give Tobago its unique topography, climate, vegetation, and anything you can think about in terms of socioeconomic consideration. I have put in on the map the location of Studley Park, which is here. It's in the Bacolet Formation. And you can see that it shows the Bacolet formation extends through the area colored in this gray color. 
And this is the location of argyle falls. And what's interesting about this is that if you look closely at it, there are several different types of rocks, several uh, falls running through this area. And that, that gives the rugged topography or rugged uh, shape of the land that is the perfect position for the waterfall. So I'm going to talk about Tobago onshore in terms of industrial rocks and minerals for economic development. I'm going to talk a little bit about and follow on on what Julia has said about water resources, earthquakes, topography, and climate. Uh, this is a picture that I got on the internet of the actual rocks at the Studley Park quarry. And as you can see, they are, these are some very large boulders. And the current situation with respect to the industrial rocks and minerals is that uh, the quarries in Tobago produce large volumes of uh, not just boulders, but aggregates and other products. But the, 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 the production is high volume, but it's a low unit value commodity. And by that, I mean that a large volume of rock fetches a relatively low price in relation to other products that countries can produce. There's very little processing. I'm showing the rocks at Studley Park Quarry and they have been used on the uh, highway to Point Fortin currently under construction. They have been used at Mosquito Creek for uh, the uh, st stabilizing of the shore in this position. And as you can see, the rocks have hardly been changed from the original form to the form that they are in, in at Mosquito Creek so that the, 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 the current position is that the, the rocks, uh, the volumes are so high and the cost, the price that they fetch on the market is so low that they can only be sold in local and nearby markets. So Studley Park products are used in Tobago for construction, in Trinidad for construction, and I believe some of them, these uh, products have been exported to St. Vincent and Guyana. But what are some of the considerations for the future? How can we have higher value products for export, uh, which is important for foreign exchange earnings? Um, what the markets in developed countries are robust and growing. Uh, recently in the US, you see that they're going to be, they're considering embarking on a $2 trillion US infrastructure um, plan. And the demand for products from other countries other than the US, because they can't supply all of their products, is going to be robust and growing. So some of the considerations are, we need to talk about, can we limit or minimize as far as possible and still make money as Stanley Park Quarry has done successfully over the last 30 years, limit the exports and seek to transform economic performance and employment by seeking to produce higher value products. And I have an example here from lime, of limestone, which is the most useful industrial material uh, most of it, most of the limestone that is quarried uh, in uh, Trinidad and Tobago is used for construction as cement or aggregate, which is a lower value product. But limestone is also an, a raw material for agricultural, metallurgical, and chemical industries. Some of the products would be paint, paper, plastic, steel, refractory linings, glass, agricultural line water treatment, et cetera, higher value products. So in our conversations about the future, what can we do with respect to adding for increasing the value 
of our indigenous raw materials, rocks, and minerals. So, to uh, contribute to the conversation, uh, I'm suggesting that a supporting national framework, including the university, for promoting industrial development and national framework is not just government, but it is business, it is civil society, we the people, uh, how can we engage in such a way to, uh, uh, to, to uh, increase the value of these raw materials? So that under the national framework, we can look at national geologic surveys, which essentially uh, send the scientists out into the field to quantify and to determine the distribution of the different rocks and minerals and establish volumes and, and, and all of that. Uh, it's costly, it's difficult, but it's not impossible. Then we have to look at what, are, as a nation, a developing nation, can be some of the uses that we would have for the byproduct or uh, from uh, the uh, using of some of our, our rocks and minerals as input products in uh, manufacture. So we need to establish national uses, look do market surveys to determine what the broader market needs. Then there are lots of, most of our, the things we consume are imported. So can we use some of these rocks and minerals as import substitute? Of course, all of that, at the end of the day, it's about making money. So the economic evaluations are important. And not just because something is high cost means it cannot be done. When you're doing your economic evaluations, you want to, to compare cost versus benefit. High costs typically give you large benefits. And low costs can give you large benefits. But it should not be that the cost is something that stops us in terms of how we perceive and conceive of the future. And when, if, if, if we, we, we determine that there are things we can do, then the National Transportation Network should include a consideration for the location of these industrial deposits. In terms of groundwater supply, now the traditional water aquifer is sandstone. And as we said, Tobago is mostly volcanic and metamorphic rocks. And by their very nature, they're composed of crystals. And some of the crystals are large, some of the crystals are small, but they don't, in their, in, in their very nature, make good water aquifers. But what's different about Tobago is because of its geologic history, where those plates are collided and are, and are sliding past one another in shape, that they have fractured a lot of these uh, metamorphic and volcanic rocks. And they have now transformed these types of rocks in certain places shown on this map. Uh, you can see some of the outlines of these large mega watersheds throughout the island in the volcanic and the metamorphic rocks. And these hold water. And it is uh, having an active, robust program to go after the water supply, water in these fractured reservoirs that is, has improved Tobago's water supply significantly since 2000. Before that time, I think that the problems with water in Tobago were quite severe. But I believe that there has been some improvement by accessing water resources in these structured rocks, an unusual uh, kind of reservoir now in Tobago. Uh, earthquakes occur when rocks move, uh, big chunks of rock move across falls relative to one another, and they can be quite dest destructive uh, if we do, if our codes for building an infrastructure are not catering for the hazard that earthquakes can uh, present. And so a national building code is a must. Uh, uh, the role of the seismic surveys in 
uh, developing and deepening our knowledge about the seismicity of Tobago and its adjacent areas is quite important. And it is, it will feed into geologic hazard management. So there's a role for science, technology, and so on in terms of the seismic survey. The unique geologic characteristics of Tobago have created a unique topography. I spoke about that large fault that runs across the island here. And as you can see, this is where the main ridge is. And the reason that main ridge is such a high feature, and in fact, it's the highest point in Tobago, is because it sits on the block that has moved up on the north side of that fault relative to the south side of the fault. So it's created that topography, which affects climate, which affects vegetation and forestation, and it affects the beauty of the island and have contributed to all of those, uh, have the potential to contribute in a more robust way to all of those industries that I have listed here. This is a map showing the forest, forests in Tobago with most of the, the thickest and heaviest forests being along Main Ridge. Here, geology affecting the location of the biggest and most uh, widespread forests on today. And let's move offshore now. More than 70% of the earth is water. And the question is, how can we use the resources in the oceans to, for economic uh, and social development? Now, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea was enacted in 1982 to provide a framework for coastal states to exercise their sovereign rights and jurisdictions. And Trinidad and Tobago have under that convention established the boundaries in the offshore that over which we will have exclusive economic rights. Now I have not, I'm not going to go through the details of this slide, except to say that in each bullet is a particular act that I have put here that established certain important boundaries that help to shape what is Trinidad and Tobago's exclusive economic zone. And uh, this map is the first and, and very important one is the map that is the, the establishment of our status as an archipelagic state. And in doing so, we had to establish archipelagic baseline shown by this red line circling Trinidad, Tobago, and some of the smaller islands in the ocean. And the importance of this line is that every other boundary is measured from related to Trinidad and Tobago, sovereign rights in the ocean is measured relative to this line. Here we have the archipelagic baseline that I showed in the previous slide. This is the boundary of our territorial sea, which is 12 nautical miles away from the archipelagic baseline, except in instances where the distance between neighboring countries is less than 12 nautical miles, in which case you have to have agreement between Trinidad and Tobago and that neighboring country in terms of where the boundary of the territorial sea is going to exist. Beyond that, we have the contiguous zone, which is another 12 nautical miles out from the archipelagic, from the territorial sea edge, another 12 uh, nautical miles. And this is the area in which when Trinidad and Tobago wishes to uh, to, uh, to uh, where uh, other uh, countries or organizations have infringed on, on Trinidad and Tobago sovereign rights. The dealing with those uh, matters, is, for example, if you have to have 
uh, things like uh, quarantining or where you're treating with somebody who has done something against the law in our territorial sea, it, the, 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 the party that has infringed on our rights can wait in this area while the matter is uh, uh, treated with. The other important boundary is the 200 nautical miles baseline from the territorial sea. And in the case where, so uh, this is the, ex establishes our exclusive economic zone. And if, and it means then that in order for us to establish a 200 nautical mile boundary from the baseline, that the nearest, next nearest state must be 400 nautical miles away from our territorial boundaries. That is not always the case. If it is less than 400 nautical miles away, then the boundary between those two states is treated by mutual discussion, negotiation, agreement between settling the boundary. Currently, the Island Tobago's exclusive economic zone is enclosed by these boundaries. This is the archipelagic boundary baseline. This is the boundary between us and Grenada, agreed uh, by mutual agreement between ourselves and Grenada. This is the boundary between ourselves and Barbados. And this is the boundary between ourselves and Venezuela. So that sets up the area within which Trinidad and Tobago can exercise sovereign rights and jurisdiction at this current moment in the offshore. So you can see that it extends our rights over a significantly larger area than just than what the land itself would allow. And some of those sovereign rights include the exploration and exploitation, conservation and management of the living and non-living natural resources of the water and the seabed and what lies below the seabed. And in that context, hydrocarbon exploration is for the production of energy from the water currents and winds. You can think about renewables and jurisdictions that allows us to put certain uh, structures, artificial structures offshore, and um, and you can do scientific research and preserve the environment and protect it in that area. The other states have the right to sail or fly over our exclusive economic zone. So, what does that mean then in terms of Tobago? Uh, this is a line drawn from Tobago to Grenada, a cross section through the earth, showing what it looks like in the subsurface. So here you have Tobago on this side, Grenada on this side. This is about 30,000 uh, uh, meters in terms of the depth down into the ground. Uh, between uh, Tobago and Grenada, we have, this is the area of the, the sea, the sea deepens towards uh, Grenada. Half of that area is under the jurisdiction of Trinidad and Tobago here, and the other half is under the jurisdiction of Grenada. And within here, we can search for hydrocarbons, for example, which we do. We can uh, manage the marine resources, we can establish offshore structures, and we could uh, do any number of things that bring dollars and cents into the, uh, the national treasury. And when you see this, this is the map of Trinidad and Tobago used for the oil and gas bid rounds where we, um, we uh, give out by competitors bid blocks and licenses for companies to explore and exploit the hydrocarbon reserves in the offshore area. And as you can see, the shape of the exclusive economic zone is the limit around which these licenses can be uh, given out. In terms of 
in the current position uh, in the offshore area, we have these red blocks show uh, some of the uh, uh, discovered gas fields to the north of Trinidad and Tobago. And then we have some oil and gas fields down in this area. And these are under production. This is under production and feeding gas to Cove Point in Tobago. These fields, hibiscus, poinsettia, chaconia, feed uh, gas to Atlantic LNG. These gas fields have not been shown to be commercial and are not under production. Uh, this slide simply gives some of the volume. So, so these are the, the gas fields in Trinidad, these are the gas fields in Venezuela, and these are some discoveries in uh, to the north of Tobago, not under production. So in conclusion, um, the geologic history of Tobago has provided a wealth of natural attributes that are building blocks for future national development. I think we have just uh, touched the tip of the iceberg in terms of what we've done with those, those uh, natural resources, especially the rocks and minerals. And uh, a lot of work is, is, is needs to be done with respect to understanding their value, what can be done with them, how much we have, and what's required to convert them into income generating resources. And whatever we do going forward, we will be built on the achievements of the past. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Carol Tenima. So, in the chat section of this Zoom meeting, we see that two persons already have questions waiting to be fielded by Mr. Nimak and also Ms. Farrell. And one of the questions is, the first question we'd have the person ask, I couldn't read it myself, but I believe the person is still in the meeting right now. And I think it would be best if she was to ask it personally, is by the former minority leader of the Tobago House of Assembly and founding mother of the Tobago Writers Guild. Ms. Deborah Moore Miggins. Ms. Deborah Moore Miggins, are you there to ask a question personally or do I need to read it out of the chat? You can read it out of the chat, please. Okay, no problem. Let me read it out of the chat. So I'm in the chat now. I'm having a difficult time seeing it. Is it possible that All right. our I, marketing uh, director could do it? Yeah, anybody, because yeah. I don't know if I can read it. Can rem I'm not seeing it either, so. I actually remember the question, though. I didn't want to read it in a different way from how I posed it. Basically, I was asking Ms. Farrell in determining Tobago rocks, offshore in particular, what limit did she use to define what is the big rock? What limits into the marine areas? How far off the landmass of the big did she, did she use? What? Okay, um, thank you for your question. I think, um, Ms. Telemark, if you could also chime in, because I, I think Ms. Telemark would have also addressed um, marine area limitations, which would help inform um, geologic exploration and exploitation of resources um, in what is considered um, the Tobago marine areas. And Ms. Telemark would have made mention of the UNCLOS as the United Nations Law of the Sea. I'm not sure if I got the complete um, acronym accurate. So if Ms. Telema, if you could chime in and um, perhaps expound on the point that we are first guided under the United Nations Law of the Sea 
to establish our mar maritime boundaries for Trinidad and Tobago. In terms of our, um, so we would fall within that remit. And then um, in terms of the establishment of acreages that would be assigned or considered Tobago's marine environment um, that would have been guided by um, the Ministry of Energy's own boundaries that they would have indicated in the maps that Mr. Limack would have shown. Mr. Limack, do I, um, have I got, have I hit the nail on the head? Um, can I access my slides again? Uh, somebody turned off the share. Is that possible? Okay. You can go ahead. I'm told you should be able to share easily. based on the conventions on the law of the sea. Um, Trinidad and Tobago has established these boundaries thus far. This has been an ongoing process over the last 50 years in terms of establishing these boundaries. And it requires a lot of scientific work, the geologists, the geologists, the cartographers, the legal people have been working uh, over all of those decades in terms of establishing these boundaries and there's still more work to be done as you can see there's an equation here and there's also a provision where we can extend our continental shelf beyond the 200 nautical miles so that establishes the boundaries around which Trinidad exercises sovereign rights and jurisdictions it means that we can explore and exploit the resources in here and use the acreage onshore and offshore for our own national purposes in terms of economic development while not preventing other states from using some of this acreage for navigation, overflight, and so on. In terms of the offshore, onshore, we can see the rocks, we can study them, we can collect them, we can take them into the, the lab and, do, uh, and, and go out into the field, and, and map where they exist and the boundaries and so on. In the offshore, it's entirely different. We cannot see the rocks because as I say, these, these rocks here are the same rocks that you see exposed on the island of Tobago in this cross section between Tobago and Grenada. These are the same rocks lying at a depth of about 20,000 meters in some instances offshore. And above those rocks, you have a fill of sedimentary rocks with the oldest rocks below and the youngest rocks above. Now, in order to, to be able to understand these rocks, we use tools such as seismic surveys, magnetic surveys, gravity surveys. Uh, when we drill wells, we collect data in the wells that allow us to be able to interpret what lies in the offshore area. So it is using those data sets. It allows us to understand what we have and what the value of these uh, rocks and, 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 the, and the, in the case of hydrocarbons, the minerals they contain. And um, so we are able to use the current technologies in that regard. So we set the limits to determine the, the exclusive economic zone, we have exclusive rights, and then we study them using scientific uh, technologies uh, that uh, geologists deploy in terms of understanding what it is we're dealing with in the substrate. And of course, the marine people in the marine, uh, people who study the, the seas and so on, they would also do similar study, studies with respect to the uh, the resources in the oceans, like fish and all of that. I hope that helps uh, with answering your question. Well, I must say it does not. Okay. Because what you have answered me with is what Trinidad and Tobago defines as its territorial 
waters is exclusive economic zone. But the yes. topic here today is about Tobago rocks. So yes. the question is, how far out do you go when you are researching Tobago rocks? I know Trinidad and Tobago has the line around it, which is all Trinidad and Tobago space. But if you're dealing here with Tobago rocks and you're saying some of Tobago rocks, of course, are on the landmass, we understand that, and the quarries, etc. When you come to the marine areas of the landmass, how far, what are your limits that tell you we're here in Tobago as opposed to Trinidad? Now, I, I know it's a loaded question, it's a big issue now. I ain't going to press you because other people have other questions, but I just want it recorded that you have not answered that. Okay, so we well, could move well, on. I, was, I can comment. I can comment. Um, it, I don't, what you would have to do uh, for me to understand uh, what you consider to be the big old rock is to tell me how you define that. Because we have the geologic context, which uh, Julia presented, showing the pieces of rock that were uh, brought from the west and the place on the north coast and off the Tobago in the geologic context. They were in place in the positions that they currently are in the geologic context. So if I were to talk about Tobago in the geologic context, uh, I would have to, you would have to, I don't know that in the geologic context, we talk about Tobago rock, we talk about the allotinous block that includes the Northern Range and Tobago that was pushed into place over the last 10 years. So Telemark. if we're talking in the geology context, that's how I would put it. Other than that, I, I can't talk outside the geology context. Okay, Ms. Farrell, in her, in her presentation, identified the andesite, the chromium, the copper, the groundwater, and the natural gas in the marine areas, all right? So I'm taking from that presentation, if it, I was happy to hear that rocks in the marine areas are included in the study. So my next question was simply, how far out into the marine areas you go to say, well, the rocks in these areas can produce natural gas. But I don't want to belabor the point or to be seen as confrontational. So I'll rest my question and listen to the other questions that my friends have. Well, if I may, I could probably add to what Ms. Telemark is saying, if I, if I um, understand what you're asking exactly. So yes, I would have presented um, the, the, the various groupings of rocks that are associated with Tobago's geology. And what you're asking, you wanted to know how far out in the marine environment those rocks transcend from surface into the marine environment. So typically, if we want to have a clearer picture of what the rocks look like in the subsurface, we, some, we at times use the rocks on land to help us inform the type of rocks in the offshore subsurface environment. Okay, so that being said, if you wanted to identify um, characteristics of Tobago's rock. You identify certain characteristics and features of the rocks on shore. We use that as a data set in itself. In collaboration with Seismic and other data that you see on Ms. Telemark's screen to basically match the presence of the, that same rock continuing within the marine environment. So just as you see the seismic section here, showing sedimentary deposits and the formation, rock the, references made to the rock the formation as we go into that trough there that you see outlined in yellow. So 
In order for them to identify that the rock deformation is found in the marine environment, we would have to have confidence that the rock deformation is out there because we see it on, we see an example of it on land. So that will give us confidence to map just how extensive that particular land mass or rock mass or horizon, and how far it extends into the marine environment. Right, so we use it as a data point and we see, we map and say, well, okay, as we go 100 kilometers, all rock is still there. We go another 50 kilometers, it's still there. After 20 kilometers, we see that the rock deformation is um, basically um, thinning out. So we know we could delimit that particular formation. And I'm just using random um, figures to explain, you know how we can determine the extent of the Tobago rock moving not only from onshore, but into the offshore environment. So it's all about using your data sets to help you determine or define and delineate the extent of these reservoirs that would contain the natural, um, they would have what we call direct hydrocarbon indicators. You would identify those indicators to know, well, yes, the rock, we, which is the reservoir, let's, let's call it the rock that we identify is like a container. When we identify the container, we want to know if this container has anything in it. This thing that we're looking for is in natural gas and how much of this container is filled with this resource. So I'm hoping that that, to some extent, may have answered your question that in order to inform how far Tobago rocks are out, out or offshore, we use what's onshore to help guide the investigations out there in terms of its description and properties in order to contain the resource itself. You're saying that as yet you don't have a, 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 a distance to which you would say, well, this is where my research ends being the end of what I see as Tobago. Okay, so in terms of, um, uh, you're asking for an actual figure. I have not seen a, a, an exact figure coming up in the papers that I would have read to date to answer a, and give you a, a correct figure. Within you must surface. know what you're, you treated as Tobago in your research. But look, could we stop here? I don't want oh, no to, problem. To, to go any further. Uh, take the other question. Leroy, hello. Hello, hi. Yeah, I'm not hearing and is the chair, is the host there? Are you hearing me now? Yes. I'm now hearing you, but I wasn't hearing before. Were you okay, talking? so I'll, I'll have to repeat everything I just said. I didn't All realize right. that I wasn't being heard. My apologies. Just one minute. Was there another question? Did I miss a question? 
Miss Host Leroy. Are you muted? No. Okay, so one of the questions that I had seen earlier in the chat was fielded by um, Sean Hutchinson or Hutch Hutchkinson, my apologies. And the question was, is the Earth's crust changing now and or constantly? And my response was an immediate yes. The Earth's crust is ever changing, but it is not easily perceptible by the eye. In fact, through research by seismic, seismic institutions, um, the Earth's crust typically moves just a few millimeters, not a few centimeters per year. Okay. Um, the, as I would have explained in the theory of plate tectonics, the little sphere on the Earth's crust is in motion over that molten mantle. Okay. And I would have also explained the various processes that would have occurred given the type of boundary that you would encounter at the edge of a plate. So for example, the convergent plate boundary, okay? This happens as I would have explained when two plate boundaries are coming together. And we know that these plates are movement, moving by the occurrence of earthquake events. So imagine two plates coming together. And I would have explained the process of subduction where one crust goes uh, under into the magma, under and below the other crust. And when, and this happens when you have a buildup of pressure and temperature changes that is occurring at that juncture. And it needs basically stress and strain relationships that it would be occurring at that time. So there would be a sudden release with that constant pushing of the plates against each other and that subduction, and the, it will manifest itself, that movement that you're asking about will manifest itself in an earthquake. So this is how we know that the Earth's crust is constantly moving. And even the seismic research unit, there are always tremors that are being picked up by the um, machines that are used at their um, institution to always um, record these minor tremors that perhaps are currently ongoing and we just simply don't feel it until we get, you know, stronger releases of energy from the Earth's crust. So to, to answer that question, yes, the Earth's crust is constantly moving and changing in small, um, in small ways, small measures. Uh, what was another question? May I ask my second question, please? Okay, sure. Am I right that the ministry you referred to that listed chromium and copper as possible areas for exploitation in Tobago did not include natural gas as a possible? So you would be correct. Um, when I, I had also viewed the page that um, the Ministry of Energy has with, with its economic minerals being listed, they listed copper and chromium, and I, I cannot recall natural gas being on the list or assigned to Tobago, I should say. So it would be on the list, but I, I, they have not assigned it under Tobago. Okay, so that would have to be... Um, something that would need to be explained by the ministry. Thank you. Do you have energy? May, may, mainly because, um, again, through my own research or my readings on trying to find papers on the, existen the existence of copper and chromium on to in Tobago, these research papers were pretty much absent. So I do not know what basis or what bases would have been used for them to assign those two particular economic minerals as a resource in Tobago. My only inference, right, as to why they would have assigned it is based on the fact that Tobago has um, a suite of volcanic rock that would um, have a mineral composition to support the existence of the ore 
that would um, be responsible for the yeah. copper and chromium minerals. But again, we don't have, there's no data on which I could um, refer to support that. But again, to go back to your question on the natural resource, they haven't assigned natural, natural gas to Tobago, but just to Trinidad. So that would be, yes, that's what I observed as well on the website. Thank you. So, also, we have a question by Ms. Chuel Green, and even myself, I have a question that is a bit of a follow-up on the Deborah Mormigan's question. Ms. Chuel Green will ask her question first, and then I will um, ask mine. Good night, everyone. Um, one of the things I observed from the both presentations, and I think a lot of the um, participants are noticing this as well, a lot of the data that we're being presented with um, is a joint data. And I want to address that from my perspective because a few things I've noticed. And the issue is, the issue really comes from the fact that a lot of the research that is happening for Trinidad and Tobago is not happening specifically for Tobago. And that is something that doing this, um, this lecture series, helping being on the committee and the team, I came to realize that Tobago data is severely lacking. So I don't I don't blame Miss Miggins um, for being a little frustrated and her question is not being answered. The answer is not being found when you try to do research. That's from my point of view. So I'm gonna go now and ask my question. That was just an observation of mine. My question is either to Miss Telemark or to Miss um, Ms. Farrell, the volume of the aquifers that you all identified, I think Ms. Telemark talked about this, right? They seem to be quite extensive in terms of the volume that could be pumped per day. And I just want to know if, if it would be safe to say, based on that, that Tobago and by extension, agriculture and the manufacturing industry should not have any water shortages or problems. And any presenter could answer. It's fine with me. Thank you. Ms. Talima, would you like to take this one? Yes. Um, well, uh, thank you for the question. Is it uh, who asked the question? Joel. 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 Yes. Joel. Thank you for the question. Um, I wouldn't. I am not. I have not been involved in the uh, water production uh, industry at all. So I wouldn't go so far as to say that I understand and know any details about the. Um, current situation in terms of need versus uh, resource for water in Tobago. What I understand, and I know that from uh, being in Tobago many, many times before 2000, I knew that water was an extremely terrible problem uh, back then, and then things have improved since 2000. And what I understand, is that some part of the reason for that improvement was targeting the, uh, the fractured reservoirs, the volcanics and metamorphic. Now, in the map that I showed, it showed the watersheds. And in those watersheds, it identified areas which in those watersheds that have been tested with wells, and those wells have been highly productive. And in fact, in some of the, the information that I reviewed, I saw that it, uh, when those wells were drilled, it practically doubled the uh, daily water production. In Tobago, I saw a number like 13 million imperial gallons of water per day. It was added by that campaign 
of filling these fractured reservoirs. But I want to qualify my statement by saying I am not an expert on water. Um, I cannot say if Tobago, Tobago now, and I don't know what Tobago's needs are in the future because I am not privy to Tobago's development plans. I cannot say that I know uh, whether there's enough water to satisfy the plans that Tobago may have uh, that would draw on the water resources that it has in the ground. So I think maybe somebody from water resources might be better Ms. position Ms. to, to yes, answer that. Yes, that might be so. Ms. Kalimak, let me amend the question. I think this might be a better question based on the map that you showed with the aquifers. Could you give us an average in terms of the maps? I'm not sure. It was a little small, so I might be wrong. Could you give us an average from the maps that you have? What kind of volumes we're looking at, um, if not in acreage, but in volumes pumped per day or possibly being able to be pumped per day from these um, aquifers? Now, oh, this is the map you're speaking about, right? I do believe so. Yeah. Right. And what this map, now there are some traditional water sources like these are local deposits out of the river courses here. Yeah. And then these are the reservoirs in the fractured granite, sorry, the fractured uh, metamorphics and volcanics. And I, I think these are some numbers of the kind of production in imperial gallons per day that they got from some of the wells that they they drilled in that campaign back in 1999 and 2000. So um, as far as that's as much as I can say with respect, some of the, the wells were uh, considered to be extremely prolific. I think they, uh, they said that they averaged between 500,000 and a million imperial gallons per day on a per well basis. I can't remember how many wells were drilled in that campaign. And I cannot say that I know what uh, water water and water resources has done since that time. Uh, with respect to identifying and um, uh, increasing the water supply to the baby. But uh, these are the numbers for the wells that were drilled under that campaign uh, for the fractured granite, sorry, fractured metamorphic okay. and volcanic. Yes, I see. Thank you, so yes. Much, Thank you so much, Ms. Talima. Thank you so much, Ms. Talima. So, hello. I also have a question, but if there's anyone else who has a question, me being the host, I would not mind waiting a minute or so. But is there anyone who wants to ask a question before I ask mine? Okay. Okay, lovely. So, here's my question. Miss Megan's question was legislative in nature more so more than so geological in nature. And I just want to point out that, and a couple other things before asking my question, because I, the question that I have, I want to make it as basic as possible because it's a very important question that is on the minds of the Begonians all over right now. Now, Ms. Julia Farrell gave a geological answer to the question, which basically is, if she's looking at a rock, anybody could tell where a rock starts and where a rock finishes. And where Tobago starts and where Tobago finishes from a geological perspective, that's a very finite number. And as a result, we know how large Tobago as a rock is. And we know that it goes beyond the sea where the land goes above sea level. And that's a very important point, in my opinion, when having the discussions that are happening right now, legislatively in Tobago. Here is the background behind my question real quick, because the question will be extremely difficult, possibly, to answer if the background isn't given. At present, from a constitutional perspective, Tobago's marine 
boundaries is something in this space of about seven to eight, nine miles or so. However, international law, it will be 200 nautical miles going towards the Atlantic. It will be about 12 miles going down towards Trinidad if Tobago was an independent nation, which it isn't. That being said, with the Joint Select Committee presently discussing the nature of Tobago from a legislative perspective, it is very important for me to understand this. Someone, a public figure, very recently said that if in the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, Tobago is defined from a geographical perspective, then the amount of area that would be owned, for want of a better word, by Trinidad and Tobago for economic purposes, we're talking in 200 nautical miles, etc., would be greater, would be reduced rather. And that person even suggested that it would be reduced significantly. Now, nations increase and decrease in size all the time. Whenever two nations that are close by to each other, I'm asking a figurative question at this point. If these two nations figuratively were islands, would the combined marine territory of each island combined be more or less than if they were initially one nation? That's my question. How does it affect the total number or the total area that could be used for economic purposes when two nations either join or separate? That's my question. I was thinking, Mr. Daniel. Let, 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 let me be a little bit more clearer. If Tobago was defined in terms of geographical area, would that in any way decrease the economical territory of Trinidad and Tobago? Does the constitution of Trinidad and Tobago have any effect on international marine law? That's, that's my question. And if it, if it cannot be answered, that's quite okay. And I'm asking uh, Ms. Tenimak based on the read up that I got from her. Uh, thank you for the question, Leroy. Trinidad and Tobago has, um, is a signatory to the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So that means that any decision we make will be guided by that framework that is established. The UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is a very complicated um, uh, document. It has, it has about 320 articles, it has 17 parts, it has nine annexes. So it is a very complicated document, which I certainly have no expertise in. Um, so I would, my answer to your question is that if, uh, rather than giving you what I believe intuitively, intuitively, I think that both countries would uh, be, be, be the, the offshore, because the law of the sea governs the oceans. So the offshore, the offshore um, territory that the two countries would have sovereign rights and jurisdiction over would change and probably they may change in the sense of becoming less for each country. But I would say that in order to answer the question is that as with 
the exercises that the technocrats and the legal people do to establish these bonds uh, that they have to do uh, sovereign rights and Is something happening? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. Someone's mic wasn't on mute and it caused some interference, but that person's mic is on mute now. Yeah. I would suggest that it is something that you, uh, that the technocrats should, um, if it has not been done already, the technocrats can examine, can do the necessary work to look at it and see what the outcome of such a change would mean for both countries. Um, but intuitively, because uh, they would now have to uh, divide up the area between themselves, uh, it intuitively it suggests that both countries uh, would have a uh, lesser territorial uh, exclusive economic zones. And that's part, I guess, the part of the reason why archipelagic states tend to uh, to, to, to define themselves as archipelagos rather than individualized, if it is possible. But it, it requires, if it has, the work has not been done already, it can be studied, it can be looked at, you can invest in the necessary resources to study it. Okay, thank you. I think that was helpful, you know. <laughs> Although I'm tempted to ignore the follow-up question I want to ask, but I'm going to ask it real quick. Now, you said it would be less I, if it was divided, obviously. It, would it be less per island or would it be less in total if you were to combine the marine territory of both islands had it been separated? And I understand it's a complex question. So yeah, I, it is, it I is a complex a, um, question. A big answer. Yeah, it is a complex question, and as I as I kind of presented, all boundaries are measured from your base baselines are established around the islands or the archipelagos, and all measurements will be taken from those bases. In case of the archipelago you measure all boundaries that include the continental shelf, the exclusive economic zone, the territorial sea, and the contiguous zone relative to the baseline. In case of an island, I believe, I, I'm not sure, but I believe that the, well, obviously the baseline will be around that island in both cases. And so all measurements, uh, presumably would be taken from those separate baselines. Okay, can thank I you, Mr. Nima. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, Ms. Shirley. Okay, good evening, everyone. Um, my question is because I'm, I be, we've been trying to get this answered all evening, but I'll put it as simple as I can. The marine and, and carbon resources that you've identified that is north of Tobago. Can you tell us what is the distance in terms of mileage from the high water mark of around Charlottesville to the nearest hydrocarbon gas fields? You want to know the exact distance? Does not have to be exact to the millimeter, but just an idea. Okay, so if you want that measurement, um, we could use a, the scale that's available to estimate that distance. Okay, I am. I'm just surprised that you're not able. If the discussion today is Tobago Rock. You're not able to say that. Now, with respect to the chromium and the rocks that are out there that you discussed and you identified, can you tell us the distance that those would be located from the high watermark baseline from Tobago? Um. 
are you talking about chromium and, and uh, copper? Yes, whatever the, the chromium and copper that you've identified, how far away from the high watermark baseline of Tobago are those located? Well, I think, um, I think what um, Julia had said is that whilst the ministry, the ministry records the existence of chromium and copper on Tobago, there's no information whatsoever regarding where those deposits are and how and what volumes they may be. So nobody is, at least as far as I'm aware, can say. And I have, I have even asked the, 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 okay. uh, some of the people in the ministry, right. it's not okay. recorded where these might be. And she is suggesting that it may simply be that the mineral constituents of the volcanics and metamorphics from a geology perspective, it's expected that they may have some trace elements of copper and chromium in them. Okay, so clearly there's a lot of geological work and research and study that needs to occur in Tobago if there is no Absolutely. data to support. Absolutely, okay. that's why I had All right. so okay. mapping so, and the, the, the survey of, of these rocks and minerals is something right. for Tobago to consider. Detailed okay. mapping and characterization. Okay. But uh, I think some basic information as opposed to distance, um, the closest point to Tobago and all of that in light of what we're discussing now should have been something that is readily available. But finally, Trinidad and Tobago is one country and it's, its boundaries are defined by the exclusive economic zone, all the things you've discussed. So my question is, if Tobago were to be an independent island, which of the twin islands, Trinidad or Tobago, would have the greatest amount of marine spaces? Well, I think it's, it's a similar question. To, thank you, Shirley, for the question. Um, I think it's similar to what uh, the question I gave, the answer I gave to Leroy's question, which is, that's something that would have to be studied carefully. Um, you would have to get the experts in to look at that. Yeah, okay. All right. Thank you for your help. But I am no um, geologist or expert on, on laws of the sea. But yeah. my, my basic information tells me that Tobago would have a greater amount of marine space than Trinidad. That is what my common sense and my information tells me if Tobago was to be an independent archaeological nation by itself. So Maybe again, that needs some further research, but that's what my level of um, common sense tell me, but I thank you for your answer and I look forward to more um, debates like this. And one further comment, Shirley, on your, your point. Um, the, when, when the information with respect to those baselines is presented to the UN, uh, they have to be all the data and information supporting the, um, the, the, the request for uh, establishment of baselines has to be uh, supported by data, information, and interpretation by the geologists, the geophysicists, the cartographers, and all uh, uh, under the umbrella of the legal framework of the convention. So that's why I say. Uh, it's, it's, it would require um, some work to understand what the implications of that would be. Because the UN has very, very stringent guidelines with respect to the data and information that supports the request. And so that's why, that's why I keep saying that it has to be carefully studied and all the data and information collected, both onshore and offshore. Thank you very much. Um, we are not. Good night. The first. Um, Ms. I want to address a few things. Ms. Shirley, your question is a very good question. And I know you were in and out of the, um, the lecture. 
you know um so you missed you missed one one important point i think that i had brought up and what i had identified um is that in going about providing experts and looking for people and, and looking for data for this lecture series this particular one what the team noticed and i think this is something that a lot of tibigonians will be able to say yes this is true is that specific information from the um from the data that we have on hand as a twin island state really excludes a lot of the work that you would use to say specifically applies to Tobago or specifically applies to Trinidad. The data is a consolidation of information. And I don't know if this was deliberate, but the data is a consolidated information that we're finding and we are having difficulty I, I'm telling you from our side of the team, trying to gather data to provide that specific for Tobago only. We are finding it difficult to find this data. So in your frustration about not getting an answer, I think for me, this lecture series, this particular one has highlighted that Tobago and the experts, the people who we have sent to university who have acquired third and uh, um, tertiary level education and their third masters and their 15 diploma and all of these things, they have to, and I think we need to empower them to do this, to go out there and do some research that is specific to Tobago, right? So that it is not pulling teeth to try to find something that when a Tobagonian asks, so what about Tobago waters? Where does it um, end? It's not an ongoing um, and uh, and I'm not sure, because we don't know. We have been looking and searching for this data and I'm sure there's somebody out there who perhaps knows, but in our search, we have not found that person yet. And I guarantee you, not only Shirley, but whoever is in the lecture who is asking, this is why we are doing the work we are doing as Tobago Writers Guild, because Tobago needs to be able to have answers that are specific to Tobago and will treat with the Tobago space. And I want to commend all the questions and comments that have come in so far, because it has highlighted for us the lack of data that we're looking at, which is something, as I said, very, very specific. To Tobago and we, we don't want to include Trinidad and Tobago in a statement in an answer but that's the data that is out there it's being provided on a very um, consistent basis like that and it is hampering us as Tobagonians us as residents of the Tobago space in in identifying exactly what data um, is specific to Tobago and what data is specific to Trinidad. And I hope that gives some, shed some light on the difficulties that we are in, um, we are experiencing in finding that information, but it's very important. This is a, this is a, a very um, important endeavor that we have to continue pushing to find that information and the consequent and subsequent lectures that we're going to be doing about Tobago, we are going to be searching for that data and we will have it to provide for you at some point. All right, ladies and gentlemen, so we're easing closer to eight o'clock, which is further than the time that we expected. So at this point, I would like to give a vote of thanks with some closing thoughts, etc. Well, basically just the two of that, the a vote of thanks and some closing thoughts. Now, while some questions were asked and there were not sufficient answers to it, it is important to note that the questions that there weren't sufficient answers for were legislative in nature, but when it comes to geology, I think we got, for me personally, I got way more answers than I expected. I got way more insight than I expected. 
when it comes to Tobago. And I was doing quite a bit of research previous to this. And for that, I would like to commend and thank Ms. Julia Farrell and also Ms. Tadney Mack for doing an excellent job. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts. And another reason why I want to thank them is because when the committee, which includes both the Tobago Library Services and the Tobago Writers Guild, was deciding the direction in which we want the lectures to go, we did decide that whatever comes out of this particular lecture will in a very large way decide what direction we go. And it seems very apparent that legislature is where we have to look at next. But of course, once the committee meets up, we're gonna have that conversation. I wanna thank, besides the two lecturers that we have today, I wanna thank the other members of the committee, two of whom are founding mothers of the Tobago Writers Guild. The members I'm speaking about is Ms. Heather Gray of the Tobago Library Services, Ms. Gabrielle Fernandez. Um, on our side, we have Ms. Lauren Boris Phillips. We have myself. We have Ms. Milka Robinson. We have Mr. Sean Hodgkinson and Mr. Rodney Pigott. I wanna thank everybody for that. I wanna give a very big thanks to our marketing director. We have probably not had more technical problems for one of these online meetings than today. Today we had a lot. And if she was not as competent and resilient as she is, definitely this would not have been able to happen. And I wanna thank Ms. Jewel Green from the bottom of my heart for being on top of everything and even being able to contribute. I wanna thank all the persons that came, asked all the relevant questions and basically set a grounds upon which we could build this lecture series. And with that, I think we could close now. Thank you very much, everyone. The meeting is about to close. Okay, thank you very much for having myself and Ms. Panama here. It was indeed an honor to present to everyone in a very concise way what information and knowledge we have to share on the subject matter. You're welcome. Okay, ladies and gentlemen. Someone else? Oh, yes, Ms. Tenimak. Sorry, my bad. Yes, thank you very much. That was short and sweet, Mr. Nimak. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the meeting has now closed. Enjoy the rest of your nights and see you next month for our next lecture.